to find you every day. It's every time. day. Uh, wow. And we have a lot to cover today. So. Oh. So one stays in and one stays out. Did so you welcome. study with Basil Schmeichel at all? Welcome to the yeah. May right. oh. Transit oh, Riders sorry. Council I'm meeting. Sorry. Can we stop the cross conversation? That's even better. Thank you. Apologies. Um, may we have an approval of today's agenda? Move to a pass. Thank you. How about the minutes? Has everybody had a chance to review them? If so, can we have an approval of the minutes? So approved. I have no corrections or anything. So, yes. Okay. Terrific. Uh, so um, we're going to go first to our guest, and I believe most people know this. I think we announced it last month, but I'm, when we get to the budget discussion today, we will certainly make sure everyone is aware of it. But one of the features of the budget, the state budget that has recently been approved, which really helps the MTA in a big way, in a way we haven't seen in a very long time, requires the MTA to come up with $400 million annually in operating efficiencies. President Davey has spoken about that at one of the committee meetings and uh -huh. talked about how technology is our friend. The great line from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 also, <laughs> technology is our friend. But um, there are ways that the MTA can utilize technology to help us save money and not have to go through larger <laughs> repair projects or, God forbid, you know, a calamity occurs and we have to rebuild something. So we're fortunate to have today uh, New York City Transit Operating Efficiencies Senior Advisor Jake Luce, who will guide us through some of the possible ways that, that uh, New York City Transit will use technology to help us to save money and get realize our $400 million in operating efficiencies. I just would like to add that this is something that Stuart has raised um, numerous times. Um, so we wanted to also uh, be responsive to, to Stuart. Absolutely. Thank you. Numerous Second that raising. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, so for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'll introduce myself. So uh, Jake Luce currently serves as a senior advisor in the Office of the President for New York City Transit. My background is I was a a lifelong New Yorker. I started my, my career working for the mayor's office of the city of New York. I was at the Office of Contract Services. Which you know, mayor? I started off in Bloomberg. Um, so I was there. And um, then when there was mayoral transition, um, as it goes, I needed a new job. So I bounced over to a management consulting firm where I focused on serving government clients here in the Northeast. That's how I got to know Rich Davies because during the transition, in Massachusetts when he'd been serving as Governor Patrick's Transportation Secretary. He also moved over to the same firm that I was at. We were working with the same clients. We got to know each other. And so when he got asked to serve as president of New York City Transit, he asked me if I would be interested in coming to help. And like long New Yorker, started my career in city government. How could I say no? So here I am. And Rich asked me to help coordinate the work related to making good on our commitment to the governor and the mayor as an exchange for new revenue so we can continue to provide the level of service we want to provide, we would find operating efficiencies. And so that's been a primary focus of, of mine. I've been here a little bit less than a year at this point and working with both the departments within transit buses, subways, paratransit, but also with shared services at MTA headquarters, as well as with Long Island Railroad and Metro North, we can collaborate on these initiatives. Uh, we have you know, made steady progress towards meeting our target of $300 million in operating savings for New York City Transit uh, so that you know, we can make sure that we've done our part in exchange for the, the revenue that the state and the city have been able to provide. So that's a bit about me and what I've been working on since I came to transit a little less than a year ago. So, you know, before I, I dive in, and uh, some of these uh, slides uh, are ones that have been at the uh, board presentations already, so I a question before I just dive in and walk through a bunch of material. Are there particular questions or areas of interest that I should make sure to, to touch on as I go through them? Does anybody have any issues they would like uh, raised during this discussion? Particular issues? 
tantrum, the supplied means you're, you're going to stop operating after sunset. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Uh, that is a beautiful. Where did you get that picture? You know, I don't know who took the photo. It's one a that great shot yeah. photo. <laughs> I mean, uh, also, it's not that easy to take. We've been uh, encouraging folks to send in photos of, of transportation, uh, and so it's great whether they're employees or members of the public. You know, it's, it's great to be able to highlight uh, some of the, the photos that our, our employees and our riders take. Oh, I, I think we'll, we'll just take your report, and then if we have questions, we'll... Thank you. Sounds good. And shall we wait to the end of the question? Or do you want us to go? Do you want us to... Uh, if there are burning questions, feel free to fire away, but then I'll also uh, uh, collect questions at the end. Thank you. So, you know, the, the first slide it just sort of makes the point that we're trying to do two things at once, which... Do you, do you have to tell me when to um, go? Oh, sorry. You can go ahead to the next one. We're, we're trying to do two things that could potentially be in tension with each other, but we're trying to figure out how to solve them both at the same time. How do we improve customer satisfaction? Well, at the same time, how do we lower the cost that it takes in order to deliver that service? And before you go on, um, I think it goes without saying, considering everything Rich has said and Chair Lieber has said, that these operating efficiencies are all without service costs. Correct. Um, I just want to get that on. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, uh, there will be some. We'll, we'll get into that later. Uh, and not only that, right? We've been pursuing things that don't involve layoffs, and, uh, and we've been pursuing things that are not premised on any changes in collective bargaining. So these feel like things that we can control uh, without you know, taking a bite out of uh, service or without you know, impacting our current employees. So the strategies that we've been pursuing in order to do that are on the next page. The first you know, we talked about, right, how do we use technology and data to improve our operations? The second is, you know, what are just the best practices that we can roll out? Um, the third is really paying attention to costs, and there are the areas that by just really sharpening the pencil and digging in, we've been able to find some savings. And the fourth is part of this has to do with investments, right, um, in order to modernize systems, in order to modernize equipment. So that we get more reliability out of that equipment, and that requires uh, upfront of capital dollars in order to run a more efficient railroad. So I'll go through um, with this as the framework, some more of the specific details about what we're doing, and then have some more, more backup from the few that we just highlighted. So some of the examples of what we're doing in the technology and data realm are e-mirrors. So we found that we have these mirrors on the side of the buses, and those are hitting things, right? So we have what we believe is a mature technology to use you know, cameras that point at the rear of the bus and be able to give a video feed to the driver inside the cab so that we're not going to have, have as many incidents where the bus mirror hits something. We've got to take that bus out of service. We have to fix it. That imposes cost to us. It's not a good experience for the, uh, the riders where we have fewer available buses as a result. We also end up paying money in legal fees. Then some of the other pieces we're getting into are predictive maintenance. So we did a very successful, we feel, pilot of predictive maintenance technology for bus, and we're working on scaling that across the entire bus fleet. And also we're looking at similar technologies for subways, both in terms of car equipment as well as in terms of maintenance and way. So there's opportunity to take a look at the data where we're seeing assets scaling and be able to better scale our maintenance intervention uh, asset data so that we get more reliability out of the asset through unexpected incidents and lower total costs. So trying again to find ways to And then there's just a lot of antiquated business processes, things that are still done on paper. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities to find to continue to modernize our system where we can end up you know, lowering the cost that it takes to execute business processes like timekeeping, for instance, we still have to uh, opportunities to uh, digitize and automate our time keeping process. Is, is the predictive maintenance really ongoing for uh, Both, right? So uh, there's definitely been a lot of ongoing activities, uh, and some of that work really has to take place first, so other work can take place, right? So we spent a lot. 
lot of uh, time and effort digitizing the data we have on our assets and digitizing workflows for maintenance. So now we can harness that data to say, well, what does that data tell us about adjustments we can make to our maintenance cycles? So we can start to enrich that over time with more uh, sensors and telematics that can tell us more about that at that condition remotely. So uh, it, I definitely see it as a, as a journey, probably a journey that will never be complete, and definitely something that we're already in the middle of, not just starting. Andrew, is it okay since you like for and very ahead. quickly, you some of us, especially me, even though I know how to use computers and everything else, I still feel more comfortable when I have data and I have material on paper, something that I can hold in my hand. I just told you, heard you say in kind of a negative way that so we don't have to use paper. Is there backup paper on everything that you're doing or just in case something happens and the system goes down or whatever with all your information? Do yeah, you have a backup or how does that work? Yeah, definitely there's plenty of redundancy in the system. Um, so whether that is um, storing data at offsite facilities, but we definitely think about system resiliency as a critical element of governing all of our systems. And we're talking about systems that are critical to the daily operation of the buses and the trains. So we, we pay a lot of attention to building redundancy so we don't have single points of failure in cases of any technology failures. But for Luddites like me, if I wanted to see something and I couldn't pick it up on my computer on my or my phone, a handheld, you know, my phone or whatever, is there a place that I could get a piece of paper with at least summaries or, or something that I can know what's going on? You know, I think in terms of what you'd be looking for, right, when it comes to uh, reports and things like that, yeah. right, we, we want to make sure all that information is available and we recognize that people have different preferences about how they get their information. So hard without knowing like a specific thing to give an answer, but I would say generally, right, um, we're looking to make sure that we are meeting everybody where they are with their preferences in terms of uh, communication technology and channels, including paper based. That's great. Thank you. Sure. James, if you ever reprint this or make this up again, you might want to make railroad two words after Long Island. That's how they do it. Ah, good call. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. But well, you don't have to bother about having it in writing, Andrew. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the uh, next bucket in terms of cost drivers, right, one of the ones we've been looking at a lot is employee availability because we've you know, seen a repeated decline in employee availability driven by a number of factors, but that ends up imposing costs because in order to meet service, we either have to expand our reserve bench of crane operators, conductors, bus operators, knowing that we're going to have people call out sick on any given day, or we have to scramble to fill those shifts on, on overtime. Um, even uh, despite those efforts, we still run into issues where we end up canceling trips that we had intended to send out. So this is both a cost driver as well as an important driver of service reliability. So definitely a place that we've been spending a lot of time in terms of how do we go about improving employee availability. I'll we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that on one of the detail pages. Uh, we insourced some cleaning positions. We found like we were able to get uh, better value uh, by insourcing, right? We're always trying to get the right balance between what do we do with internal staff versus what do we do outsource. And this was an area where we found we were able to save some money by hiring up internal staff and about being able to wind down uh, outsource contract that we had. And then we're, you know, talking to our top suppliers to explain that this is a fiscal situation that we're in. You know, how can we improve the value that um, we both get out of this relationship? Including things like how can we be a better customer? Are there practices that we have that impose costs on you that you're passing back to us? So it's important that we you know, listen with both of our ears um, to some of our top suppliers if we want to be able to lower our, our costs. And we've been doing that in collaboration with um, Long Island Railroad and Metro North because we share many of those top suppliers. Uh, so it's important for us to speak with one voice as MPA. So the third category in terms of uh, you know, standards, best practices, how do we do business and how do we just make sure that we're doing it the right way in places that really matter. So you know, one piece here is the station agent where we're able to restructure the role of the station agent. We feel that 
question of providing better customer service to our customers, we were able to do it in such a way that we ended up actually lowering the net costs that we're paying for station agents. Then um, I, I touched on this a little bit in terms of the top supplier bit, but you know, working with the railroads to do things like standardized specs or front of purchasing power to make sure we get the best possible deal. And then we're also taking a look at you know, how do we manage track access, which is a very valuable commodity. So you know, how do we find the right trade-offs between impacting customers versus giving our maintenance crews the ability to do you know, quality and productive maintenance um, without train traffic going on. So you know, trying to get that right balance. And then finally, in terms of some of the areas where you know, we believe that upfront investments are going to pay off in terms of reduced operating expenditures are energy, right? Whether it's energy efficient boilers, whether it's, you know, it's taking a look through energy audits at our individual facilities and just seeing you know, where we're paying more than uh, over here than over there for HVAC and finding ways to reduce costs. And that also helps with our commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're taking a look at the non-revenue fleet. So all of the work vehicles, both for buses as well as for subways. And what we've seen is that our maintenance costs are going up, so we think we can get the right balance between purchasing the vehicle that will be more reliable so that they'll be available to our staff and we won't have to pay as much to maintain them. Oh, I'm doing that. I saw it on the board agenda. Yep, yep. And, we're trying to yep, yep. Um, and then we are taking a look also at our shops, right, and looking to make investments in the places where our uh, employees work in order to give them the shop floor layout to allow them to be more productive, making sure the equipment that they rely on, you know, is is available and in good working order because you know, without the right layout, um, without the right equipment, you know, we know that we can't be as productive. So that's another area where we're looking to make sure we're making the right investment um, so that our employees can do their jobs efficiently and productively. So that's sort of the, the overview, but uh, we wanted to give a little bit of texture. Before you leave that slide, um, you mentioned spending like the money on the uh, customer service agent. Um, obviously, those employees have gotten a reduced a reduction in their salary. So, is it that they're performing double duty? Is that what is giving you the, the break there? No, we were actually able to increase hourly wages as part of the deal with them. What we did is we took a look at um, coverage and backfill, and you know, find ways to make sure that we you know get the right coverage uh, while paying people more, but without you know having. Uh, you know, double coverage or backfills in some areas. Um, so that, that was the way that as we took a look at it, we, we were able to strike the right balance, both you know, paying our employees more for changing the job duties and, and delivering more, making sure we got everybody where we need them to be um, from a customer's point of view, but finding a way to do that in such a way that we were lowering total cost. So I'll jump into some of the specific examples to pick one from each of those categories. You see what we were uh, mentioning in terms of uh, the e mirrors. And you know, here, you know, some portion of the savings is related to we don't have to spend as much time and money fixing our buses, but a lot of it has to do with lawsuits as well, right? So MTA spends a, a bunch of money um, on, on lawsuits and people to us, whether it's the bus collision or a slip trip to the mall, um, you know, somewhere in the subway system. Um, so trying to find ways to reduce those costs you know, is an example of you know, where we can end up spending less without you know, impacting uh, any of our customers. So the next area we wanted to highlight was employee availability. So I, I touched on why this matters in terms of the, the costs that were occurring um, as availability has declined over many years, as well as the service impact. And so what we've been working on here is um, both the motivational factors, right? How do we just uh, be as good of an employer as we can be across industries? There's a relationship between levels of employee engagement and levels of employee attendance, which you know, makes intuitive sense. So we're, on one hand, trying to say, how do we tell people that the job you're doing is important, right? Uh, how do we say thank you for, for a job well done? We did a, a survey of transit employees, and 
you know, we were very happy that people reported that they have a real sense of mission for working in transit, uh, but it definitely revealed that there's some areas where you know, we can do a better job as an employer, and you know, we believe that's one of the things that will you know, result in improved availability. And the other bit, too, is you know, in order to have generous leave programs, we also need to make sure that we're paying attention to you know, waste, fraud, and abuse to protect the integrity of those leave programs. So that's what we're working with, you know, partners in the workers' compensation unit, um, partners in labor relations to make sure that, um, you know, when, when somebody, you know, calls out, right, that that's really a valid reason, right? We've got some due diligence that we need to do as part of our responsibilities as an employer. And we believe the combination of, of those two things, both being as good of an employer as we can be, um, but also making sure that you know, the rules are followed. And those are the, the things that we're doing you know, with our partners in labor in order to drive employee availability back to some of the levels that we were at you know, prior to COVID and hopefully even higher. Another question. Um, have you seen a correlation between the increase in assaults on transit workers and the increase or, and, the, and the decrease in availability? So uh, definitely as um, we have seen employees assaulted, right, that uh, has a big impact on availability, right, because there's both the physical as well as the emotional toll of that. Um, so we are um, working with PD, we're also working with labor um, to find ways that we can do as much as we can to reduce employee assault. Um, we're working with the workers' compensation unit and the employee assistance program to, if someone is assaulted, to help them not only with the medical side of that, but also help them to process the emotional side of that so that they can, you know, get better and get back to work as quickly as possible. Um, so both in terms of, of reduction as well as in terms of support, um, you know, that's what we're trying to do to address the employee's assault, which definitely is a meaningful um, part of availability overall. Do you have that, I mean, is there a pullout? I'm just wondering if there's a pullout uh, percentage of that and if that would be helpful as you try to, um, as you seek legislation, um, assault-related legislation, not in this session, obviously, but ne next session, to show that correlation. Yep, yep, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, we, uh, we know, right, that workers' compensation um, is, a, is a big part of this, and we know that assaults are a big part of workers' compensation, so that's yep. a lot of stuff. Uh, so yeah. yeah. Have you actually administered <coughs> the uh, engagement surveys yet to the staff, or is it something being contemplated? No, um, we we have done the first right. version of the survey. Um, and is there anything that jumps out that staff are asking for that um, that wouldn't involve additional collective bargaining or things you can do to tweak their experience? Oh yeah, there's definitely a lot um, that falls in that category. Um, so you know, one of the big um, themes is is recognition. Right, so um, you know, we ask a lot of people, uh, and, and what we've heard is there's more opportunities to say thank you. So some of what we've done is roll out some new employee recognition programs for you know, say bus operators or bus operators who have really good uh, availability records. Right, um, so recognition was one thing. You know, another bit was just you know having the work environment I needed. Right. So um, uh, modern facilities, working bathrooms, you know, the equipment I need, right? So um, that was definitely another area. Um, and then, uh, you know, people uh, talked as well about uh, wanting to feel like they, when they see leadership, it's not always negative, right? Um, and just we get out there more in the field. Um, so, you know, looking to uh, encourage all of our managers and to see, you know, part of the job, not just that when something goes wrong, figuring out, you know, who to blame, uh, but, you know, to say job well done, to be out there to understand, you know, what it's like uh, for, you know, that employee. Because it's not one thing, it's, it's a lot of things, and it's also how we go about it to really make people feel, feel heard. Um, so I don't think there was anything that was too surprising, but, you know, we felt that it was important just to, just to spend a little bit of time and effort to quantify that. Um, so we could really give managers information about, you know, here's what your staff are saying so that, you know, you as a manager have more than just anecdotal feel to, to go on. Thank you. Jake, what does recognition mean? Is it monetary? Time? So um, what we're talking about is, is really not uh, performance bonuses like you might, 
you know, think about it in a private sector organization. So, you know, if we're getting somebody a pin, right, you know, it's a, it's a token value, right, but it's really more um, taking the time uh, to, to recognize them and say thank you for a job well done. Um, uh, in the dark ages when I worked here, one of the things, whenever I got complaints about an employee, and I actually started a program, and I was wondering if you contemplated this based on their asking people to actually put in writing or online or something, not just their complaints, but actually their compliments. So you start, you know, yes, availability and some kind of reward, but actually involving the public and the writing public, because it looks like that as people that there were really problems once people started coming back to the subway or to subway and buses to mass transit. So I was wondering if you have thought about that, but actually making some kind of a of a program. I, I mentioned this briefly to, uh, to uh, Rich and then with everything else going on, but you may want to take it back to him and tell him it came from Trudy and he'll say, oh, you <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, seriously, it it worked a long time ago, and looking at what you have up there, it might work, and it might involve the public again in 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 knowing that there are good things and that they should, will be a part of it. Yeah, I uh, not only do I agree, uh, we we have been doing that a little bit, and I'm sure there's opportunities to do more, but we've especially using uh, some of the social media engagement channels we have with the public um, in order to be able to, when we hear positive things, you know, be able to um, recognize that employee, working with our partners in internal communications to, to put things on MTA TV for their colleagues to see, as well as you know, you know just creating these little, um, uh, some departments are starting to do just little commendations where a, a manager can just you know, hand out mm -hmm. you know, a little piece of paper. A gold star. Exactly, right. Um, but like but you just said, again, and it's because there are a lot of old people like me who do ride the subways and buses, that you might suggest not only putting it on, you know, that they send an email or a text, but that also they can send a letter, they can send a note, they can send something so that you're involving all levels of uh, not just people who use social media. Yeah, we definitely want to solicit that type of positive feedback as well. I agree. Um, I think you had your hand up first. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm seconding what you said. And if it were easy, if you could just go to the website, click, and do it. I mean, so often I've wanted to commend someone, and it's such a process that I don't bother. But yeah. if it was really simple, I think people would do that a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'll just share a personal uh, experience when I was working for the city working on the weekend, I locked myself out of my, my office, I couldn't get back in, uh, I had to go to the, the guards in order to try to get help, but you know, the building guards weren't available, so they sent me to one center street where they had the, you know, the building you know, sort of security headquarters for all the city, so like, well, we don't have the, you know, the key to that particular building that you work in. But the guy lent me a couple bucks for subway fare, and so I wanted. I called you know three one one to try to be like you know hey there was this you know car he was working on Saturday at you know one center street and you know he really helped me out. I wanted to say thank you. They're they're looking through you know all the different uh, service paths. I'm like oh we don't actually have an option to commend an employee. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I I think we they probably we, have yeah. one now. So we do need to make it as easy as possible for everybody yeah. to give us those positive experiences. And then actually have a campaign, you know, saying, please let us know when we're doing something simple or, yeah. or whatever. Um, I saw a hand in the back. No, no, out in my hand. Oh, oh Chris. Yeah. Uh, glad everyone mentioned all the good stuff, but there is one piece I'm glad someone saved me the good piece. Uh, there is one, 3% of scheduling subways are always claiming we're seeing trips are shorthanded. And to be honest with you, I don't see it short on short on crews because when I'm seeing, like, I'm going to say the A line, sorry, Andrew, but it's the truth. Um, Why are you sorry, Andrew? I don't own the A line. Yes, you do. The A line because you live on it. No, just kidding. Um, I your initial on the Thank you. Right. Thank you. But as a, as a, let me just get to this point. They always claim. That A or the Q, they're short on crews. But the problem is, if you look at the clock time, 
they're one minute behind each other. And the, the problem what I'm seeing is, is I don't see it. There's no shortness on crew. I can understand there's shortness on the bus drivers because some drivers do need a road breather. Sometimes they have to go to the bathroom. It's not easy for them as well as the crew. I'm glad driver. they go to the bathroom. Some don't, Trudy. Let's. Let's, I'm going to plead right. a fifth right there. Moving on. Thank you, Lisa. That can my emotions. Um, the bottom line is, is communication needs to be a little more better. But with this right now still going on even today, and I'm like, we're almost, I'm not going to say we're completely done with COVID because something can always come up. Bottom line is, 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 is there going to be a way that we can hear announcements or when we see this on the phone or app or computer, not saying we're short on trains, but there is a delay or long wait. But there is no long wait because the train, you have too many northbound for none of them southbound. So they're like, the numbers might be maybe right or maybe off because they're not counting that why is there a delay. Somebody can hold the door. Or there's another train in front of it because once they're at 59th Street, forget it, you're stuck. It is, it is true, you know, the way that the data works right, mm -hmm. is for every train that's delayed, we have to pick a reason in our data, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there could actually be more than one thing that happened over the course of that, that trip. So, um, you know, this is, um, this is based on uh, sort of daily um, reporting that we're doing where we're saying, you know, every time a trip is either delayed or canceled or missed stop, how come? Um, and even if there might be multiple reasons, um, you know, this is the, uh, the percent of time that that is the reason that um, our staff you know, identify uh, it was because of a crew shortage. In the back. So in the case of employee availability, what it's meant is we've been really just um, getting top leadership both within the departments as well as at MTA headquarters together to really just spend time first understanding the problem in terms of data. So cutting it down by title over time, how much of the problem is people who are out a little bit versus people that are a lot, we spent a lot of time on the data. Um, and then based on what the data was telling us were the biggest problems, we spent a lot of time figuring out well, what can we do differently, right? So whether that was you know, working with the law department in terms of workers' compensation, whether that was working with PWU in terms of what are the opportunities we have to actually protect workers from the fall. I, I guess what I, I mean by that is um, really just investing um, time to better understand the problem, break it down into the components of it, figure out know, what can we do about it. So there's um, a lot of complexity that goes into um, employee availability, right? Because so it's train operators and bus maintainers, right? The problems are different for everybody, um, but we have been collectively, um, you know, spending a lot of time on employee availability as a, um, a top issue because it's one of those examples where it's a big issue and it's big both in terms of cost as well as, as, well as in terms of service to customers. Um, so the next page talks a little bit about um, how it's going so far. Some of the things that we're doing I, I mentioned already, we have started to see an improvement in the numbers two days improvement in terms of um, uh, last year versus the year before. We expect to you know, continue to drive this in the range of that. Um, uh, so the uh, next bit uh, was around station agents. And so I just don't have the, the video queued up, uh, but for folks that saw the, the board presentation, uh, presented a, a video of video mm -hmm. this. Um, but you know, we, we talked about this a little bit. We, we felt that by really taking a look at the, the role of the station agent um, working with uh, TWU, that we've been able to find a, uh, a different operating model that both provides better service to the customers, more compensation to the employees, um, you know, as well as you know, reduce costs to you know, our, our stakeholders. And then the, the last bit I'll touch on is, is energy savings. So there's a, a lot that goes here. You know, the New York City Transit is one of the largest consumers of energy in all of New York State. Um, so there's a lot um, that we can gain even from small um, improvements in efficiency. So some things that um, we're, we're doing, folks have maybe already seen some of the new LEDs. We've uh, done that in a couple of cases in a couple of trains in the pilot. 
the research shows that people actually prefer the quality of light that they get from LEDs. So we see this as part of you know, benefit to customers in terms of a faster, cleaner, safer plan. But in addition, LEDs use less energy and they last longer. Uh, so it's um, going to be, in addition to you know, just better quality light for the people that are moving throughout the system, it's ultimately cheaper to provide that light with you know, less greenhouse gas emissions. We're taking a look at boilers, right? There's just a lot of opportunities, as anybody who owns a home knows. Um, to periodically take a look at, you know, your, your, your costs related to, you know, the, the boiler. And there's a lot of more energy efficient units that are out there. If it's been a while since you replaced your boiler, you know, it may be possible to, to save some money with a new boiler. And we're finding that's true for, for our facilities. Um, part of this is, is data as well. So uh, there was, a, there's an effort to, you know, kind of get all this data in one place. Um, so we're rolling out a new energy management system so we can really do things like compare depot to depot. And, it, and we've seen that there are some outliers where the costs are seen for this depot are higher than average. So we've been able to send people out and say, oh, you know, hey, what's going on there? You know, and they've been able to you know, identify you know, the reason that we're seeing uh, that and be able to, to address that. Um, so we've already started to be able to reduce some of the energy problems for our bus depots you know, as a result of the insights that this uh, new data system Question. Um, yesterday or the day before, there was an article about um, the cost of energy and getting the energy suppliers on board with with um, the large consumers like the MTA. And um, is there an effort or something um, underway with the other transportation and, you know, industry, uh, operators or whomever, uh, large um, users of energy? to find a different um, category of user or um, anything to reduce the cost for such a major? Yeah, so um, I don't know that we've uh, done it jointly with others, but we're, we're so big in and of ourselves that we uh, spend a lot of time working with ComEd um, on what's the appropriate rate, uh, as well as working with them on programs like uh, peak shaving where you know, we work to lower our demand at peak periods um, in exchange for you know, cash back from them. So um, you know, it's, it's an interesting idea. What might we be able to do with some of our, our peers? But then again, we always do we have no peer. Uh, and so you know, we, we feel like we have been able to just based on our size alone you know, have good collaborative uh, relationships with Con Ed. LED lights last a lot longer than the traditional lights? They do. They do. Uh, so the, you know, it depends on the particular model that you're comparing, but for some of our, our most common lights, the manufacturer specs are 70,000 hours of runtime for an LED versus 20,000 hours for the traditional bulb. So, you know, it, it, it depends again on the, on the specifics. Um, and the manufacturer specs. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I feel very bullish uh, that we're, uh, by making a big effort, to really scale LEDs across um, all our facilities, subway tunnels, subway cars, uh, that there you know, will be real material savings. And a big part of that is because we just don't need to replace the light bulbs as often. So you know, both material savings as well as labor savings. Andrew? Yes. Um, because the going LED lights, since I've seen this on Atlantic Avenue, Barclays, I know the B&Q, you know, everyone's saying, oh my god, I can see the light, even going down the staircase. I see them going, like, oh my God, any bright, I think I'm, everyone's going to see me. I'm like, yeah, they're going to see you because they, it also makes it easy for the cameras to catch someone who's going to act inappropriate. And some of this it actually does work because we can see. If we can have LD lights more on the elevators, it'll be like saying, oh, I can see now. I can get on and off safely. Yeah, the before and after photos. Um, uh, for the before and after photos from York Street, I, I felt were quite dramatic um, in terms of. You know, they're calling Atlantic, the, uh, they're saying, they're like, one person saying, I can see the light. Mm -hmm. I'm like, <laughs> and then one person saying, let there be light. So it'll take a long time, right? There'll be a lot of light bulbs across the system, <laughs> uh, but we're, yeah. we're slowly starting to send it uh, toward the There's a joke in there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Watch out for the light at the end of the tunnel because there may be a train coming at you rather than. Um, but now, I have noticed. Well, I, it's not 
recent, but it's even more, that instead of using um, paper advertising, instead of using the big thing, that it's all more and more electronically. And I'm wondering, is, has there been a cost saving in not using Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, has has there been any consideration of the cost in using, the, I guess, electric signs or what, I don't know what they're called. You yeah, know, rather than advertising panels. Is, rather than the paper advertising panels. And also, is there any consideration about changing car cards on, especially on buses, to an electronic? advertising like they've done on the subways. Yeah, so um, it's not something that we have factored into this particular push towards uh, cost savings. There might be some cost savings. Um, we just haven't accounted for it as, as part of this. And certainly when it comes to our passenger communication systems, like you know, the ones you mentioned on bus, you know, long-term effort, but you know, more and more um, rolling out uh, more um, digital signage. Which we find. That's, that's, that was the word I was looking for. Yeah. yeah, you know, because it just gives us more tools to be able to communicate with our customers in, in a flexible way. So it's not necessarily the, fine, the cost, but rather the, the efficiency of, of communicating. Yeah. Hi, I'm just curious about the regenerative bridging. So that means like the energy that's used for breaks is then recaptured and goes back into the system. Is that, is that how I'm understanding it? Correct. And I'm okay. going to be, you know, uh, way in the deep end in terms of the technology, okay. but fundamentally um, you, you've got that right. Um, so the uh, there's some technical challenges, right, in terms of really being able to capture that energy, right? When it comes to energy, a lot of the challenge is storing it, um, but that's what we're, you know, pilot. Does that mean you have to change the, the track or is that something that's on the train? Like, where would that mechanism to capture that energy live? Yep. Um, uh, so the, the place where we're actually captured, my understanding, would be kind of on the wayside. Um, but I'm probably getting to the point where I'm in danger of just uh, getting it wrong on this one. So I'm going to have to uh, beg ignorance on the technical details. And would that just be subway? Or is that subway in the railroad? Is that so the buses in the future? I, uh, I don't know if the railroads um, are, are looking at this. Um, I know it's something we're looking at for, for subways. So it's, it's actually, we looked at that as part of the sustainability resiliency opus that was under development by, that's, that's the word, really, right? Um, <laughs> but for our, um, that, our, that our office has undertaken. Um, and we thought that like the best perfect spot to do it could be at um, that's all the point, which should be acceptable. But back in that, uh, but, sorry, uh, but that's you know that's like a real cross section. But it's bus depot, Long Island Railroad, and the seven train. And as the seven train just keeps going back and forth, that that's a great place to capture energy that could potentially be used for charging for the buses. And as the railroads go in and out, um, you know, there's a way to capture that as well. We'd also looked at solar. Um, questions about whether or not there's legal taxation um, issues there, but we've done some research into that. We have that back. So, but we've been, we, we can sit down and talk to you about regenerative breaking until you wish you'd never asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding, because it's been tried before in the system, is that every time a train breaks, this energy is captured. It wouldn't be just that one terminal or anything. Right. It's right. a continuum. Right. But there are certain places where there are battery collectors, and that was one of the things that Richard talked about, that there are, that there's mobile battery collector units. That's not a technical term. But that um, where it would be stored and then redistributed throughout the system, um, throughout more localized aspects of the system. Yeah. Oh, I married one instead. It's much easier. <laughs> one, one last, one, one, one other thing. Going back to the very beginning of your presentation, when you talked about the electronic um, mirror, um, yeah, mirrors on the side. But there is one thing that, and this is just the result of my own communication with bus drivers when I can, and and we we have been making a whole thing. I mean, we the MTA. 
and and uh, New York City Transit, and especially with buses, about about bus lanes and about keeping cars and and delivery trucks and everything to speed the traffic along. I mean, and I live with this going down Second Avenue all the time. Um, and I have asked bus drivers because supposedly we now have cameras on the buses or are getting cameras that automatically, if there's a blockage, will do it. And just this is my own survey, you know, totally unscientific, but most of them say, oh, yeah, we're supposed to do something if we see someone blocking, but it, it sounds like it's not electronic and it's not automatic that, again, based on a very unscientific survey, but that the bus driver actually has to, if they see something blocking it, has to literally snap on and take a picture or, or something. I, I don't know how it works. Maybe you can answer that. Maybe. Yeah, I will admit I don't know a ton about the precise mechanism of the ABLE program in terms of what, if anything, ABLE, the that's the uh, automatic. Have to do. It's automatic is yeah, the word. So, so it right. just, yeah, nobody has to do anything. I know, but the well, bus but I, drivers say that it's you know, not. It's, well, this, this it's a newer, evolved program. So yeah. it's not it's, every route is ABLE equipped yet. But yeah, but they will be. And now uh, they just they don't have to it's not just buses, it's no, bike lanes and bus stops. But but I mean but it's the buses are what will be taking the picture and the, the whether it's a photograph so, or the image or whatever you want to call it. Correct. So Lisa's right. Um we're it's not every bus currently, so um, it takes us time to you know, install the technology across the entire fleet, but we are um, moving with all deliberate speed because we were very happy with the expansion of the ABLE program in the latest state budget because we believe it really is a big benefit to improving bus speeds, which is one of our customers' of course, no. biggest needs. But then we have the human factor again. Are, are the bus drivers, because a couple of them, again, totally unscientific survey on my part, uh, but have, are they being briefed about the ABLE program and that they have that the automatic cameras or whatever they're called, you know, are on their buses and everything? And uh, is, it, is there human involvement in, in, the, yeah, in, so in this whole thing? I have to plead ignorance on the, on the details, but I know that, you know, Frank and the leadership team of buses, you know, this is sort of one of their top priorities and it's one of our top legislative priorities. And so as we get cameras installed, making sure that the operators and everybody else involved in the, um, the full business process you know, knows what they need to do is a top priority as well because it involves not just us, but it also involves the City Department of Finance. So it's a complicated um, mechanism to make sure that if somebody is in the bus lane and gets a ticket, that, you know, that gets captured and you know, they get that fine. There's actually a lot of steps in that process. But um, it's one of the most important things. Yeah, yeah as I said, it, uh, okay. Well, if I talk to bus drivers from Kate, which is that bus operators do not interact with the able cameras, the human review is done after the fact by reviewing the footage from the automated system. Where, where is that? It's on. It's in the chat. Oh, from okay. Kate Cantino. Bus operators have enough to do okay. with that. Yeah. No, no, I know that, that but uh, what I'm really saying, I'm not saying that the, they should do it or anything, but I'm saying that again. Very, it's not non-scientific survey, but that they know about it. That's what I'm suggesting. That that all bus or, or are they? And the, I just happened to hit, hit the ones that weren't listening. I mean, that's possible also. But yeah, and you know, it may also just be the case that it's part of um, the, the rollout and just haven't gotten to, to them yet. Um, so we don't have able on all the buses yet. There's another question. No, I just I have a phone full of pictures of cars parked in bus lanes. <laughs> and again, if it was easy to report it, I would. I don't think you could probably ticket them from me, but there could be a system of sending them you know, some kind of a notification that this has been noticed and they should be careful. So there is a, there is a city council passed legislation that allows for that, but it, it's, um, it took away the reward uh, um, so that otherwise it would probably say we go broke. Um, we can get you that information. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's fully implemented yet. I think it was just passed, but it um, we'll, we'll get that information. It's a, like a citizen um, alert or a citizen merit. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but it is it is for um, blocking the bus lane and um, bike pass. That's why I use double pass, double parking. Right. And I apologize. I, I should wrap up soon, but maybe I can take one more question. Thank you so much. Well, thank yes. Thank you guys. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And say hi to Rich and tell him thank you. So, let's move on to my report. Uh, so, ridership continues to climb. We've had multiple now, multiple days of over 4 million subway riders a day. That's the sort of becoming the norm. Uh, Rather than the exception, which is which is great. Um, I've also seen reports of some employers saying we would like you to return to the office four days a week, not three days anymore. Don't know how many companies are actually going to go through with that, but that will obviously mean greater ridership. And if you've seen the news reports recently, Broadway has experienced virtually pre-pandemic attendance records, which means that ridership is also great in the evenings and weekends, uh, which is another reason why, and I'm going to get into the service improvements uh, in a little bit, but those are part of the times that the service is going to be increased. Additional business for restaurants in the area and Absolutely. all of that. Yep. That would be really great, but ridership is also high on commuter rail. Both Metro North and Long Island Road have reported like 250,000 uh, riders. Uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a musical accompaniment. Oh, God, Sharon. Yeah. Well, you tell us, you bring with the ridership up? Yeah. Anyway, um, so that's, that's all good news. One little piece of not so good news is, and it's being worked on, uh, President Rinaldi mentioned yesterday, but Connecticut is contemplating cutting subsidies to Metro North New Haven line and unfortunately Shoreline East as well uh, because they think that riders haven't returned uh, quick enough and they don't want to pay for service well. that's not being utilized when in fact the New Haven line is the busiest of the three commuter lines on Metro. Oh my but God. The, uh, no, but Andrew, the, the person who spoke in, during the public speaking from the unions made it clear that they're just talking about it right now. Yeah. Okay. And everybody that I know in Connecticut who then called, I made a couple of calls after the meeting to say, hey, are you screwing us? I, whatever the word is. Uh, um, over, you know, after we getting things straightened out, and they said, no, you had your deliberations, your budget deliberations, now we are having ours. No, no, but every, no. And Kathy, I think, made it very clear she did. that she's talking to the governor and, and her Please equivalent in everything. I do. So uh, after the report yesterday, Ed Valenti, who was the um, um, head of one of the uh, labor... Right, the the one, is, that's um, the one who spoke, yeah. At, at Metro North. Um, we reached out to him. I also reached out to Kathy Rinaldi yesterday after, um, after I spoke to Randy, uh, who, as you know, is the chair of the Metro North um, Borough Commuter Council, see what we could do and ask Kathy what would be most, the most helpful way for us to get involved um, in trying to stop these potentially debilitating cuts. Because you can't just run service to Connecticut, cut, kick people off the train, <laughs> And then, you know, say, but by good luck. I mean, you could. You can't but, run, run trains just in New York State. Right. But that line gets serviced. But I don't think that's right. being considered. You know, it, 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 New Haven. All sorts of things are being considered. If Connecticut doesn't want to fund it, it's $38 million. So, as you said, it's a deliberative process. Yeah, exactly. But um, uh, today, um, Randy participated in a call that was at noon, so I, I was here with the Connecticut um, Rail commuter council uh, to, to, to see how we could partner and I've been in communication with Ed Lundy um, several times today uh, already about our, our collective next steps on how we can ensure that Metro North Railroad um, riders don't get short end of Connecticut's budget steps. And um, 
uh, at spoken to, you know, Will Schwartz is also doing outreach to elected officials in Westchester, mm -hmm. et cetera. And um, our Metro North members will also do outreach to um, elected officials in the area. So we're keeping our, our finger very tightly on the pulse yeah. and are working with elected officials, with commuters, um, with the uh, with and Jim Cameron, who used to be head of that council and has sort of formed his own splinter group, but is still a powerful voice on the uh, commuter uh, advocacy side and rights for several. There are a number of uh, sympathetic elected officials exactly. in Connecticut, so it is part of the iterative process of the budget, but. Um, their state might be smaller, but now they got a lot more New York voices playing in. So yeah. it's got more of an attitude. Well, what I was saying is, is not to at all treat it like a fait accompli, because they are where we we were a couple of weeks ago in right. terms of their in terms of their budgetary. Because as soon as I heard this, I called a couple of people who I know through my various contacts, and I said, "Hey, are you screwing us over?" And they said, "No." Absolutely, absolutely not that. But they have to go through their deliberations just it's, as we've gone through ours. The, the dangerous issue that's being raised is, well, ridership is this, so that's the level of service that should be offered. Um, and that's a conversation that we've had around this table and at the other council tables that, that we sit at, um, is that, you know, service adjustment is code word or service cuts, right? So adjusting service to ridership level means that that's the level that you're always going to have. You're never seeking to increase it. And some of those major employers who are bringing people back five days a week include J.P. Morgan Chase, which is has an entrance into Van Central. So there are, there are people who are going to be like, mm, I'm just going to find a local office. I can go work anywhere. Uh, so this it's something we are... Um, taken very seriously. It's ironic, too, because Connecticut has funded improvements in rail service over the last few years. There's a, there's a rail line frequent yeah. service now from New Haven north to Hartford. Absolutely. They've added service to Shoreline East. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this would be so counterproductive yeah. to, to the state of Connecticut. I and can't imagine it's going to happen. I, th I think Governor Lamar has that. come out in support of congestion pricing. So the time you could be working. Yes. Uh, Andrew? Yes. I gotta say one, two, two questions, and this is not a let's not joke on this. I've been on that line, and I was on a train this past Saturday on an overcrowded train. How can they say the ridership is down? I've seen a lot of accessibility customers that uses that train. It goes from the Bronx to Fordham, to Fordham, to New, all the way out to maybe New Haven or to Stanford. They are not really, you know, they got to look at the numbers because ridership is up. Metro North Care staff have been numbers. increasing because they have more people using that line. The, that train runs to New Haven every 30 minutes, or the one that goes to Stanford runs every 30 minutes. You had a train like, it's like, I don't, it's not a deserted line. That train does get severely crowded. We're not talking about bicycles. We're talking about seniors and people with disabilities. And I don't like how some of our news stations uh, yesterday, I was listening, that Kathy said right now there is, they're working on it, but they always like to jump to conclusion on the news, like ABC7 claiming, oh, they're going to do the cuts. Before you jump to conclusion, check your facts before it comes. It's okay. If they talk about it that way, more people are going to get upset. They're going to contact Yeah, they're not going to get people. upset. That's okay. They'll contact the legislature. But that's what I said. What Lisa is, was doing, and I, in my own way, through my own contact, yeah. was checking the facts because, and that's why I'm reporting what I am to you mm -hmm. right now, what I was able to find out. And, um, and you know. It's super ironic because major improvements. They're, they're now repairing the bridge in Norwalk that the tracks pass over, which mm -hmm. has been a constricting <laughs> feature of, of speed along mm -hmm. along the uh, New Haven line. Yeah. They've, uh, they're going to be shutting down the New Canaan branch from this coming weekend all the way through Labor Day to repair the New Canaan branch. There will only be bus service from Stanford up to the New Canaan branch. So they're doing lots of capital work, so to cut service just makes no sense. But Let's move on. Um, so everybody, of course, has heard about the fair increase that is coming around Labor Day. 
it is um, proposed I, to be. Proposed, yes, it will be yes, voted on in way. the July board meeting. Excuse me, the June board meeting with public hearings to be held in July. The public hearings will be in person and hybrid. The other way around. Yeah, I'm sorry. What did I say? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You had the vote coming yeah. back. The hearings come first, of course. Um, and, and, but to be to be put into effect around Labor Day, um, it's five percent for the subways and buses. Um, but when you factor in the lower rate on the weeklies and monthly, it is a, a net of four percent, which is what they were aiming at. So the subway would go to two ninety. The seven day pass would go. Uh, of only 3% or $1 to $34, and the monthly is 4%, which is $5, which brings it up to 132 Express buses would be 4%, which is a quarter extra, bringing it to $7. City ticket would still be $5, but there will be a peak city ticket, which will be $7. City ticket was not available in peak, but it will be made available. But here's the possible dark side, and that is... Um, they are talking, it is not a done deal yet, but talking about molding, or melding, I should say, yeah. Atlantic <laughs> ticket into city ticket, but not keeping the $60 weekly free transfer to subways and buses. I spoke at the board and I said, I understand that you might not want to confuse people with an Atlantic ticket, make it all city ticket, but keep that discount, and in fact, make, make it so that others around the boroughs can use that discount, the $60 monthly or whatever the fare will be once the fare increase comes through. Um, I said if you're going to have peak fares for city, you can also make the weekly peak, but don't do away with it. This is, this is a major bonus for riders and gets people on the system. Plus, with congestion pricing hopefully coming next year, I will get into that a little bit, uh, there will be even more people utilizing the system, so why not take advantage of it and keep the transfer? It just encourages even more ridership. If you have your commuter rail, your subway, and your bus all paid for, there's less chance you're going to drive because you paid for it. And plus, we're going to be adding three of the four new Bronx stations on Penn Access are far from subways. Obviously, Hunts Point is right next to the number six one. Thank but you. All the others are far from subways. Yes. So this is a no-brainer. I think we should keep that discount and expand it. Andrew, yes. as I told you, you were absolutely eloquent in your Thanks. defense. Uh, it, it wasn't just that you spoke about it, mm -hmm. and that that's ours. I also sent a note after the, the uh, committee meeting was over to uh, to our Atlantic ticket maven to Bradley, who, who I still keep in touch with, um, saying that the work that he did comes around and uh, and that yeah. you spoke about it at the, at the board or the Did committee you hear meeting. Back from him? Uh, I haven't heard back oh. from him yet, but I I know he's very busy and everything. But I just wanted him to know because that's something that we should all be proud of that we did. And I think I, for one, because I'm always criticizing you on things, but was really proud of the way that you spoke about it. Uh, um, also, another piece of good news is Far Rockaway will be included in city ticket. Um, you'll have to purchase it either on the train time app or physically in at the Far Rockaway station. Those are the places that Far Rockaway will be available. But a Far Rockaway ticket is the only ticket. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, it's done correctly. Yes, Karen. Um, I was curious, what about the areas like Cambria Heights, uh, Wall Park and Bellows that are in Queens? We have that new Bellwell station that was supposed to help some of them, but that's considered Long Island station, so they don't get to take advantage of the city village. Yeah, Queens Village is, is, is part of city ticket, right. but I think UBS Elmont is because it's on the borderline with Nassau may not be. Right, and so the people who live closest to that station, they're not being captured in any way. Yeah, they probably would go to Queens Village to take advantage of that. Not easily, like in terms of transit, and there's not parking at that station. Oh, but it's ADA accessible. And if you look at the schedule, UBS Elmont gets lots more service than Queens Village. I, lots more. Yeah, so I, I, I think that there was something lost because I remember when it was approved and they were building it, they were like, oh, and they were going to have a transfer for workers and for people who lived in Queens, um, Cambria Heights and some other communities. 
I, I don't know if it happened, but they're not going to be able to avail themselves of the cheaper care. I'm going to I'm going to investigate that. I have a feeling it's because of all the events that are taking place and that people are taking the shuttle bus to as well from there that they didn't include it in city ticket. Andrew? Yes. Uh, just to add, um, we know that Accessory definitely stops at that station, and they not just switching from the nice one, but they also do get on the Long Island Railroad there. I was, Ms. Greif and I were the Which station? Testing. The arena station, UBS, 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 UBS station, which I was there at the opening, because I have to have to prove it. Okay. So, and we did, we did. You think we didn't believe you, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling everyone else. I didn't say you. Oh, I didn't say you. But, uh, but Andrew, there is something that it's, it's been brought up at the 88 task force that why can't you have a $5 ticket to that station if you're part Queens, part NASA, and it's another 88 accessible. Karen. What about the ability to buy your ticket um, on the app? Right now. A bank ticket, yeah. Any movement on that? No. Um, again, any ticket can be. Yes. Uh, Atlantic ticket has been treated a little bit like a stepchild in that regard, um, but it has had great, I mean, it's brought people onto the trains that weren't riding before. Absolutely has, and I think the ability to get the weekly and have your subway and bus included is the way we should be going. Absolutely. No, uh, um, I just want to jump in. Good. So Ryan, our intern, and has hey, been working uh, versus me and now with Kara. Uh, by the way, they're both graduating on Tuesday. Um, but uh, they've been working on a fair policy report and uh, and looking at one of the first things like how many different kind of ticket types are there? It's like dozens. So simplifying the different types and quantities and confusion, confusing array of ticket and types. Peak is still on there. Yeah, oh, it, it just makes see. it just makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense to to, um, to 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 simplify the different op and consolidate the options. It does not make sense while doing that to to remove the weekly option call it city ticket, whatever you choose. Right. If you buy a weekly Long Island or a ticket, it doesn't have to if you want a weekly teacher on a piece, there's got to be a way exactly. to do it a price point. But um, so we're, we're looking at like what a rationalizing thing, um, which you know are, are, will be suggestions that, that are being made, but um, introducing new pilots and trying to cram some more things onto ticket vending machines will be just going to make everybody just go, so just, I'll just take that. Um, or we're trying to put more things onto your phone when there's already eight different ticket types that you could buy now. It's just going to make you just lose one. So figure out the way to, to simplify it, rationalize it, but get people the best value for the best travel. Simplify it, rationalize it, but don't take away any of the good parts that it currently has. Yeah, well, I, I, I do think that's critical. I know it makes seem like a new point, but right now, Atlantic um, terminal riders, they're they're getting the, the line of the um, the transferring that they have to do at Jamaica, signals on not knowing, it, and then the added, oh, I have to buy my ticket. So if they're not getting the weekly because they're not going in each day, having to go to the machine that may or may not be working then. So it's just, it, it feels like it's not the same trans, it's not the same train system for people going to the Yeah, they keep emphasizing that it's a pilot. Uh, but, you know, that pilot has landed. It's, it's been really successful. Yeah. And uh, fine if you want to convert it to city ticket, but don't take away the good parts, the advantages of it. That would not be a plus. And we, we're going to keep saying that. Um, Smush it together, yeah. yeah. But speaking <laughs> of smooshing, you know, they're not smooshing it on to pay for out, uh, outreaching it because they're yeah, not they able. Won't. They won't. They won't, they won't, they won't, won't anyway them. because they think it's not important. And again, even when we started this Atlantic ticket years ago, they still never did any enough. They outreach. do have some of those ads when they were talking. When you know, when they when they when t tickets um, rolled out on weekdays, they um, and they had the video screens. We asked them and they complied and they agreed to and they did and they still are showing the Atlantic ticket ads on the uh, 
video displays. So they are being shown. The video part, I agree. Yeah. Uh, that I don't have Infrared any issue. Infrared are just not. Just not uh, let me know. I've got so much more. No, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so obviously, Long Island Railroad and Metro North are also getting fare increases. Uh, not a surprise there. Uh, in the area of 4.3% increase, uh, Ryan is looking at the discrepancies between the two railroads in how much they charge per mile, where the zones reach and where they don't reach. It's, it's, we were going through various iterations on his computer and everybody understands there's large discrepancies. You pay a different amount depending on how far you are from the city on a different railroad, on a different line. Uh, it's even on the same railroad on different lines. It's where, where they've decided to make the zone. There is still going to be a $500 monthly cap, so no commuter uh, from wherever will pay more than $500 a month. Uh, but, you know, those monthly fares are, are getting up there. Yeah, they're getting up there. So uh, we will see uh, how your – when do you expect um, – to be ready by any chance? We, um, so we, we met with uh, Laura Wild um, and spoke about it. We separated some of the reservation policy and fair policy out, which makes it much more palatable and we don't have to solve all the world's problems. Um, and hopefully we'll be able, after, right after graduation. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. which is Next Tuesday. Week. That graduation again is on Tuesday. <laughs> Um, yeah, no party, no cake here. What's wrong with this? No, well, let's wait till that actually happens. Right. Yeah. yeah. And also, that'll be the fourth Thursday. Just saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just give it a warning. I said cake. I didn't say when. We have it at some kind of we'll, celebration we'll, of the PCA. We'll, 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 but anyway, oh, uh, so we'll get that. We'll, we will. Um, we want to. <laughs> why don't we make a goal to share the draft report with you guys? At so that everyone can take a look at it. We can discuss it or yeah. in advance of UCAC. And graduation pictures, too. And, um, Zoom and Andrew we'll, we'll, we'll get it to you guys in advance of UCAC so that we can discuss it and see if there's any um, questions what? or concerns. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say on the issue of fares is I pushed and pushed, and I guess I was heard, so we are going to be getting rolling fare capping. It's not just going to be on Monday through Sunday. Not everybody travels that way. Wow. It'll be starting the day you you start. Oh, that's nice. great. So that is a great thing. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I'm also obviously hoping to get monthly fare capping uh, on Omni as well as we. Uh, that'll get more people doing that. Um, How will it trigger? Or your bot, how is it? The first time you use it is what will trigger. Oh, so either weekly or monthly, yeah. depending. Ah, how you use it. If you use it so many times, you know, it, it would know it's, it's going to be the monthly rate, not the weekly rate. So. That's the best news I've heard today. Yeah, I, I, really, I really hope this happens soon. Well, rolling fare capping is coming at, at the time of the fare increase. Um, will that be included in whatever it will is be, written yes. about it? There so will that be notices the public of the proposal. Uh, on buses, on trains, on the on the out front advertising panels, on seat drops, on the commuter railroads. Lunch prints, please. Uh, they will be all over the place. So, believe But me. will that be included in these notices that one of the things will be about the fare capping and the monthly and weekly? Yeah, fare it'll be one of the fare proposals. I am sure yeah. it will. Oh, yeah. okay. Because it, it is a change. Uh, Andrew, just yes. to add the Omni, uh, Dave, and as Q just told me today, um, the testers for Omni, which is me, uh, will be testing that out <laughs> starting uh, soon. <laughs> well, I am the one has to reduce your test card and eat it, but all good. You keep testing. Well, of course I'm going to test it. What do you think I have fun with all these buses when the machines they don't program right? That's bad. Thank I you. I hope you report the uh, machine number. How long you know me? I always do. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, as an aside, let me just give a huge shout out and thank you. Bill Gill, he, we have received his formal um, resignation letter, which, will, which has been submitted to the various uh, agencies that needed it. Bill was a longtime member, was chair of the PCAC, was, uh, was our, uh, you know, uh, our lawyer on a lot of issues. He gave a lot of legal advice to the organization. Um, he you know, um, moved to Pennsylvania, to Bangor, Pennsylvania, actually not Maine, but Pennsylvania. And um, uh, he's living there with his, uh, with some of his family. Um, 
don't believe he's all that ambulatory, but uh, he sounds fine when you talk to him. His mind is sharp, which is great, and we, we wish him the best and thank him for all his years of service here. So thank you, Bill. I just like to add is that the mayor's office, on behalf of the mayor, sent a letter of thanks to him. As oh, well. that's yeah. good, yeah. good, good. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, so let me let me go into um, some budget. Talk here. Uh, so much. Okay, so our our speaker today was was about the part of the budget that mandates a four hundred million dollars per year on operating efficiencies, and Jake told you some of the ways that's going to happen. So obviously, the budget was really good news for us. Um, the increase in the top rate of the payroll mobility tax, albeit only for businesses within the five boroughs, not in the suburban counties, um, will generate an additional $1.1 billion to the MTA per year. But the PMT. Yeah, but I'm talking about the PMT, which is only in the city, only I for. Just said that, true. Yeah, no, but you then. In the over boroughs. because it's going to go to all 14 okay. counties. It is going to help the MTA, which includes the suburban counties. Yes, absolutely. No. But they didn't want the increase from the PMT. But they're getting the benefit. They get the benefits. Uh, they get the yeah, benefits. exactly. So, so it 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 takes from the city, but it gives to all 14 counties. Well, considering it was money we didn't have before, it also gives to the city. But okay. I'm being very chauvinistic as a, as a, as a New York City I get representative. It, um, it also well. increases New York City's share of paratransit services to the tune of $165 million a year. Um, they wanted more, but the city agreed to pay just $165. $165 one million. Thank you. Yeah. So that will go to help uh, donuts. Set the ride and, and yeah, donuts. exactly. <laughs> donuts, right. Um, Krispy Kreme. There was a $300 million in one-time state uh, aid to to offset the account, the impact of the pandemic on the on the agency. That's the one time. That's not yearly. Unfortunately, um, there was $35 million in investments to improve subway service, which I will get into in a little bit. $65 million to reduce the proposed fare increase, which would have been, um, as you know. They were talking not four, but 5.5 percent, which would have brought us to the three dollar range for the for the single fare. Um, what the MTA apparently wants to continue to do, and I I think it's a great idea, is to reward our best customers, which means that while the single fare might go up a certain amount, but the bargain still exists between the weekly, the fare capping, and the monthly, and those are very very important to keep. And, and, and the chair of the finance committee, uh, Neil Zuckerman, also said we have to reward our best customers. <laughs> They're our bread and butter. It's different. The rate of increase to weeklies and monthlies is lower than the rate of increase to the single ride. Yes. Okay. So. Um, there's also $35 million in safety investments to protect riders, and part of that is this ABLE camera system, which is going to be installed all over the place, take photographs of license of offending vehicles. Um, what would be really great is if some of our state officials, it hasn't happened yet, and our community board has even asked about it. If you are found blocking a bus lane or, or a bike lane or, or, or if you're a delivery vehicle that's in the wrong place, after so many transgressions, it's possible you don't get your vehicle registration renewed. There has to be some some kick to this, otherwise it's just you know a reminder. Oh, you were bad, you know. And, but isn't there, there a fine? fine is, but, isn't there a fine attached? There's to it? a fine, but you know the people who are doing these deliveries just consider those fines the cost of doing business. They're also blocking the bus stops too, which yes, is not fair are. either. Sure. But the fines might be progressing. Yeah, so they, they are, are progressing right to a now, point, but yeah. after a certain point, they're not. Go up, like first a, they go up to like $100 or 100 dollars exactly. yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, so what you can do is confiscate your vehicle, license, and registration. 
comes out, you can do it. Hey, you should go with Jack. Don't you come back no more, no more. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. If you, you lose your registration, you can't be out there driving. So. Well, he uh, seconded your motion, Andrew. He's right. Yeah, no, I hear that. Um, That's a good one. Now, one of the items in the budget, and I'm going to turn it over to Trudy because she has really late-breaking information, is the money from folks. There's one amount from the construction of the casino, and then there's the operating funds from the casino. Those are down the road, and that's been acknowledged, that you wouldn't see those monies until the earliest, probably 2026. But Trudy has some information that I just learned today. So, Trudy, you want to? Yeah, uh, and I have this in writing, and um, I, I've confirmed it with at least two people who are knowledgeable who told me about it and some of it is in writing and I'll read that to you and there's only one name that I'm going to mention and some of you know it Joe Adabo who is the as a chair senator state senator Joe Adabo who is the chair of the uh, they call it its official name is the committee on racing I'm reading it from here racing gaming and wagering <laughs> They don't call it casinos. They don't. Go, that gaming is is, is, is is gambling. Okay. Anyway, and uh, basically, uh, this was in print that he isn't a fan of Governor Kathy Hochul's plan to direct funding to the MTA, and I think I brought this up at one of our last meetings because in the legislation. Um, when casinos were approved, and you left out one thing, one part of the money, that everybody who uh, applies, and right now I believe there are 10 applications or potential applications for casinos, uh, and there are big fights going on of whether there's going to be one near Chase Stadium, whether it's going to be at the racetracks, whether it's going to be where the, the casinos or like casinos are already in existence near the racetracks, whatever. But in order to just submit an application, the application fee is $500 million, right? Off the bat. And none of that money, there was all kinds of confusion whether any of that was going to go to the MTA. The, 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 the problem was is that when all of this was brought up, it was not in the legislation setting up the committee or the commission on game, the gaming commission, and that all proceeds from the from the application fees, from the from the actual the building, you know, the, the building fees and everything else was only going to go to education. There is still, and it, I think it came up at your at your at the board meeting also that it is questionable whether there was a change put into the budget, the, the governor's budget document. She says that it, it, it is, but there are others like Senator Adabo who disagree. And basically what his, and I'm going to read his quote because it was in print, is that, is that the MTA won't see any cash at least until 2026, even if there is anything at all, which means that for this fair raise, you know, this proposed fair raise or whatever, none of the money, and that seemed to be the confusion, it Andrew. Seen that from the beginning. Well, that's not the way it came across, and again, I made some calls and I asked. Oh, I asked the Chief Financial Officer, Kevin Willinson. He said we, we, we wouldn't count on that money until 2026 well, the, the earlier. Well, the, you know, I, I, I learned this a long time ago in, in doing PR and getting, you know, getting messages out. The facts are irrelevant. It's the perception that counts. And the perception out there is that some of the money was going to go into this either this fiscal year or the next fiscal year as, as far as offsetting. But none of it, just so that we make it clear and that everybody around this table understands, that no MTA funding is ex – no, none well, of the gambling fund yeah, funding we get it. Yeah, yeah. is expected until at least 
2026, and there is some confusion or disagreement or whatever you want to call it, whether it, whether the money going even then to the MTA would be is in the governor's in the govern in the new budget document, and there are people who are in a position to know disagree with each other. People in the legislature well, or whatever. I can tell you, from what seeing is, Kevin's pre presentation at one of the finance committee meetings, they showed the out years. They showed 23, 4, 5, 6, 7, and the money from gaming and or casinos, whatever you want to call it, wagering was one of your words, was not even coming till at least then. Okay. Well, as I said, so there seems to be a disagreement dollars. about from people, and I know Kevin Will but is PMT brilliant is and big, wonderful, but there seems to be from ver various people who should be in a position to know and sh who shouldn't have this kind of disagreement, but seem to have a disagreement about when, when and if money is coming to us. And I just thought I would bring this to, to all of your attention so that you can go on from there. Okay, thank you. So they're going to sit with $5 billion distributed. They're not getting it. The casinos won't be open until it's But certain. the casinos got to put up the $500 million. And yeah. none, of that, none yeah. of that is for that, the MTA. That's not, that the application fee is not. The application none fee. Of no. None of that application, okay. those application fees of $500 million each. And it's nobody knows how many it's will actually. Talk about one in Nassau, where the Coliseum it, was. It, it depends. Yeah. It, as I said, there are right now ten. Maybe near Shea, near. Shea, near no, right now, I, I just Shea, said that. City yeah, field. no, I just. Um, there are see. ten potential yeah. well, see how applications that. of five million, five hundred million each. But whether there's ten or whether there's two, that's just the application yep. fee. Yep. None of it goes to okay. the MTA. Thank you. I have, yes, a, I have a question, uh, and I think this is something we need to think on, and I'm not saying we should vote. Are we going to support this if it does go through? And I say the word if before we all jump. Let me say my words. If it does, let's say it did go through, and we're in 2026, are we going to support this or we're not going to support it or we're going to wait? Yeah, but there's nothing to support. It's part of the budget. That no, no, I didn't, say, I didn't say now. I said future I to think you know, about. I think let's cross that bridge when it materializes before. Then, then yeah. that's what I'm saying. So I'm going to say that to be announced. So let me just tell you about Thank some you. great news about service increases that are coming. In July, on weekends, G, J, and M lines are going to be running every eight to nine minutes. That's a major improvement right there. On August, on weekdays, C, N, and R lines are going to run every eight minutes. And weekends, the one and the six, the locals on both sides of town will be running every six minutes. Really? Yes. Is that a promise? That's done. <laughs> Hold your breath for that. In December, on weekday evenings, C, N, R, and G lines will be running every eight minutes. So this is and a big improvement to off-peak, uh, evening, and weekend uh, frequencies, which is which was in the state budget and which is mandated, and which President Davey has said will happen. Yes, Mr. X. Yes, there has been no change in that. I hear you. And on many weekends, in case you haven't noticed, they're not even running that far. They're running like, you know, to Bedford Nostrand while they do track work. So. <laughs> But anyway, that's that's good. That's good news. Um, those improvements. Andrew, are can you really repeat the train letters again? Because you went way too fast. It's all. No, I want to make sure because some people call me liars, pants on fire. July weekends, G, J, and M, every eight to nine minutes. G, J, and M. I heard you. August on weekdays, C, N, and R, every eight minutes. Weekends, one and six, every six minutes. That's August. In uh, July of 2024, B, D, J, and M, uh, every eight minutes. And on weekends, the three and the five will be running every ten minutes. And that's a major improvement on the three, I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. For sure. So, 
Is that in the budget? It's, it's in the, it's, the MTA yes. budget? It's in, it, what the state gave to the MTA for service increases, and this is what the MTA says they will do with that money. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Wait, wait, Deborah, sorry. Yeah, where are, they, where are they getting all the extra cars and equipment to run these trains? I thought they were short and it's rolling stock. <laughs> and crews. And crews. And, and bigger crews. Uh, they do always pay overtime, but they, okay. they believe they will have the equipment and the um, Obviously, the 211s will continue to be rolling in uh, regularly now that they've been tested. Um, they're about to test the Staten Island Railway version. Uh, it's in Coney Island Yard. Yeah, they're going to be testing that shortly because the R44s on Staten Island Railway are really old. Really old. Uh, but no, uh, they, they are planning for these services. Okay, but thank you. <laughs> I'm Bert. Deborah, you were next, and then Mr. Ray. I'm hoping for the G train it goes up. Five cars is not enough. They need to go at least six or seven. That line gets packed. So I hope when they're increasing it, they need to increase the length of the If they train. increase the frequency, as is anticipated, I think they would have to increase the length because I think the ridership would go up. Ridership's already up. It's packed. Yeah, but there's so many GOs on the G line now. Wow. Well, it's also an old one. That's the direct. It's possible the power that we give input as one. Benefits us, not with the power that we us. The first pay marshal adopted a too late budget. Then she decided, I mean, she gives you this news, but decides something's wanted to keep the G train truncated at Four Square, which is worse than truncated to putting fly through, which was the case at one time. She needs to give us something like a poll and let us adopt what's best for us, not what she feels is the best for us, since she still spends so time here in New York City County. You're, you're, you're under a misapprehension. The governor is not the person who dictated what service is getting adjusted. The governor and the legislature gave money. It's New York City Transit that is determining which services are getting improved, okay. not Albany. Okay. Richard Davies. <laughs> G-Line be extended to back all the way to Forest Hills again? Mm -hmm. In my proposal, which I first typed about two years ago, I said leave the church and I typed leave the church and the G-Train must run to 179th Street and Forest Boulevard. In addition, it must carry the full train lane. 179th even further than it once ran. That's what it should do. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. But thank you. Uh, we, we, we do advocate for our riders, and if we think that something should be changed, we advocate for it. Trust me. Uh, we, have, we have seen various proposals, and we have sounded off on those proposals that were not good ones. Uh, we have a question on, from Carl. Yeah, sure. Um, there's been nothing mentioned regarding the MTA to provide additional transfers for passion for passengers that ride the system only a few days a week but need more than one transfer to get to or from their destination. Oh. Essentially, to be like the transfer or so. These passengers are now paying a double fare. In Nassau County, Night Bus currently allows two transfers for one fare, and that's only one county. In New York City, we've got five boroughs and counties, so sometimes passengers need additional transfers to get to and from their destination. Possibly a time transfer policy would be better where a passenger could get unlimited transfers for up to two hours or two hours, 30 minutes for one fare. Passengers that tell us commute a few days a week and many seniors don't use the transfer system daily to reach seven-day capping discounts so this would provide some 
financial relief for those passengers. So you've been advocating for at least a three-legged transfer or time transfers for quite some time. Yeah, I have. And um, I will bring that up again. Um, I think that makes a great deal of sense. Whenever there's a GO and you have to take uh, an additional bus, they do give you the three-legged transfer. So it's not like they, they don't know about them and have an institute. Them. So that's a great idea. Um, I think that's probably it for me. No, you left out one thing. What's that? About the buses. The, the, uh, oh, the one free bus per borough, yes. Yeah, and... That uh, is part of the budget as well. Um, so that that is coming. Um, but Frank, do you have Frank, any idea of, of how don't. it's going to be, since there's only one, and everybody is lobbying, I do know one thing that has been made pretty clear at the meetings, which is it will not be a route that on which there are multiple bus lines because they don't want to take riders from one mm -hmm. to another. It yeah. will be a route that runs by itself. Yeah, no, that. But how and when will that decision be made? Will it be at the same time as the fare that the fare goes up in uh, September? I don't know the content, or? but I will find that out. I don't know what the proposed. Uh, implementation date of the free buses. I just know that it's going to be in 2023. So, uh, so other things that Jan always said is that, you know, it's an opportunity to look at connectivity and yeah. subway I, deserts. Yes. Uh, no, I understand get, what it uh, is. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Um, but, but, I, 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 you may understand, Judy, but you asked a question. Uh, other okay. People may no, not but, know the answer. Okay, so but then I will ask my question again. Could you just give me one moment um, so that to, to even potentially create look at creating new routes as the redesigns are, going, are underway, that this is an opportunity to see um, what makes make the most sense from an equity lens. Yeah, like, okay. like what Karen was had brought yeah. up earlier about parts of Queens, and I know that there's parts of other boroughs that have, that have similar yeah. uh, South of Brooklyn, there's places where there are no trains anywhere near you, not even commuter trains, and this is a, this is a place where you might want to do that. Uh, that would be a great idea for where the free bus is to get people on the system and using the system. Yeah, true. Well, okay. What I I I know what has been said. Why this is good. It, when something is forced down your <clears throat> your throat or other parts of your anatomy, uh, and you have to go along with it because Mr. Assemblyman Mam Ma, Ma, I'm going to say it right. Mam Dami. Dami. Mom, Mom, Danny. Anyway, nobody really. He was. He's a fresh of no. He had nothing to do with transportation. But this is now his idea, and for whatever reason, everybody agreed to go along with it. And yes, Lisa, what Jana was saying is, he has to do it. So this, this is. You can give all kinds of rationales. My question is, and it's supposedly going to take effect at the same time that. Uh, the fair raise takes effect in September or Labor Day or whatever. So I'm asking, has there now been any discussion or, or, and maybe it's something that we should also put our two cents or our two dollars and ninety cents in or whatever on um, one of the, the good bus lanes in each. If anyone here has a has a, an idea of of which routes meet. Uh, this test of being in transit desert areas and don't have another bus line along their route, please suggest it to us, and we'll submit it to the uh, to the transit authority. Absolutely. Act has already mentioned it already. Uh, they some of the act members in other boroughs have been mentioning certain routes where it is not easy to get to an accessible train station. So that was brought up also. Um, and right now, I'm stuck because it's hard to choose because there are a lot of buses that do run in a by itself or is in a desert. So it's like you only can choose one bus. So if they tell me I can choose two, I will tell them it has to be route that is very heavy. Right. It can't be on the east side. It's one, no, it's not. It's not on the east side. I know that already. But it's, it's, and it, but it was my understanding that this will take effect as, time as when the fare increase. I don't have so. the exact information on that. But uh, the good news on congestion pricing is that um, we're really
fairly close to the issuing of the FONSI. We have gotten the environmental okay from the Federal Highway Administration, uh, much to the consternation of folks in New Jersey, although some folks in New Jersey are backing it. Um, some folks in New Jersey, the majority of folks are, a lot of people are drunk. Yes, I mean, it's not, it's not as though if you're a Jersey resident, you come here, you, you ride the MTA, you're not going to get the benefit, or if you drive here from New Jersey, you're not going to get the benefit of clearer streets. I mean, there's just so many ways New Jersey residents will benefit from this as well. Um, we would love to see New Jersey improve their mass transit. However, 75% of them who commute to the city are still not driving. They're commuting by bus or New Jersey transit or pass. So obviously, it's not the greatest to drive from New Jersey still. Uh, so, you know, we will see where this goes. What about the Jersey, what about the lawsuits from the, the what's his name? Uh, Heimer and Menendez. Scott Heimer. Yeah. So far, there's nothing yet been filed. There has been threatened. Menendez has threatened to put forward legislation that would deprive New York of its federal transportation of federal transit money, but that um, somebody might consider that to be blowing smoke. Menendez actually said that. Yes, yeah. he did. On that. He did say that. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's not, I'm not sure that that it's you know whatever. That's, that's his own political calculus. There are, <laughs> yeah. some, there are some possible ways to equalize traffic by including, uh, well, we don't know what the TMRB is going to do, but it's pretty clear that if you paid an MTA bridge or tunnel toll or a Port Authority bridge or tunnel toll, that you will get credit for those on the, uh, on the congestion fee. I think that's pretty clear. That being the case, um, there are some proposals to, like, Include the GW Bridge, which is not in the congestion zone. Uh, and you want to say a few words on some of the. You don't want to say anything yet? No. Okay. <laughs> there are some proposals out there <laughs> to equalize uh, traffic in various ways so that nobody is, is impacted uh, more than somebody else uh, within a certain geographic limit. I, I'm only saying no because there are um, a lot of conversations happening with a lot of people um, and there's not, uh, not, not a consensus. Not consensus. Um, but there, uh, you know, the TMRB will be meeting soon, and at that point, the pylon for exemptions will happen. But baked into the legislation and that created congestion pricing in 2019 was a bottom line dollar of at least a billion dollars uh, coming to the MTA that would bond to 15 billion. So that can be accomplished in a number of different ways with several different exemptions, but uh, that are included is new mitigation that were uh, incorporated into the letter of legal sufficiency and draft finding of no significant impact um, that was issued by the feds um, uh, two weeks ago. So um, we're waiting for a 30-day period of public availability to be over, which is on or about June 12th or 13th, at which point either the federal government will um, issue their final policy a, or um, will require the MTA to respond to additional comments, even though this is not a public comment period. They anticipate, it is anticipated that more comments will come in, and either the feds will require or the MTA will um, agreeably, and its partners in this application will agreeably respond to the comments as part of the process. Uh, all eyes are on New York right now. Um, so that will be part of, um, will either happen before or concurrently with the issuance of the FONSI. Following the issuance of the FONSI, the TMRB will be convened. Once, once the FONSI, a couple things happen. The TMR, once the FONSI is, final FONSI is issued, the contract to begin installation of the tolling gantries begins. And there are 310 days. Um, for completion of that, but I believe that there are incentives that are built into that to try and get it um, reduced, and I think it's 280 days of the full. Um, the um, TMRB, which is a two written into legislation, I believe, was to be convened no less than six months before um, the program took effect, would be convening those meetings. There are not hearings, but there'll be public meetings will be held 
probably in August, September, huh. and then the um, then the race will begin. Lisa and Andrew, have yeah. either of you heard? Again, I'm, I've heard rumblings that because what was issued is called the draft funding, that one of the ideas, and it's not just New Jersey, it's some of our colleagues in, and maybe we can bring this up at the um, at the PCAC meeting, but colleagues in Westchester, Rockland, Orange, et cetera, are also saying that they will have more questions, and so that actually using it as a delaying tactic. And I was just wondering if you have heard any of this, and maybe we can bring this up at the, I'll ask that this be put on the agenda, let me, let me officially ask, at the PCAC meeting, because ho hopefully some of our members um, from, it, it seems to be uh, the, the upstate, not so much Long Island. No, there's people. Long Island, too. Is, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, well Long Island and Orange get a little rail service compared to the others, but they are very some, some of the Some of the um, thought process about potentially equalizing the tolls or allowing credits for that George Washington Bridge would, could be to um, dilute some of the concerns from New Jersey and Rockland County. There may be no diluting. Um, it could be diluting. <laughs> to be just about diluting. But, you know, there has been a lot of talk oh, about boy. improving service um, to East of Hudson from West of Hudson. That would support Brooklyn and also improving West of Hudson service. So, so and now those are things that um, Ken Zabrowski, who is the, yeah, Ken Zabrowski, who is the uh, assembly chair of um, corporations, is um, from Rockland County. And it has been really uh, okay. amazing. I, I wasn't going to mention any, of, any names uh, about but with of, any um, of congestion pricing. So there are there are bound to be more questions, but the feds have indicated that the questioning part of um, delaying tactics is done. That they, you know, the MT may be asked well, to respond. I saw Veronica Vanderpool at a conference, and I mentioned, are you guys really going to hold up a final Fonzie? to make the MTA answer the same questions over? And she goes, who said that? And I uh, said, well, that's one I've, of the things we've heard. I've heard, she said I have heard it, it, well, that they may, there's that a lot of may not, it's not there's a lot of difference of, of yeah. opinion about what, what they are doing, who is doing it, and, and what they are entitled to do or not entitled to do, but that it's because what was issued was a quote unquote draft okay. Fonzie, that it can be, done over and over and over again, and, and there are people from on the federal level uh, or federal elected level on, you know, that it are... It can't be done over and over and over again, it, but it could be, there could be some changes to it, some additional mitigation. TMRB um, could uh, uh, advance some different proposals and different funding structures that could require some additional modeling, and that will probably be... And, that's, and that delays. That, no, it's built in, sort of. That's why it's a six-month period, mm -hmm. and there's different modeling options. And it's a I, I hope you're right. Maybe raise on and so on, they can raise. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, what? Just yes. Just yes. <laughs> right, yes, to me. No, no, we got yes uh, into what we said. In terms of the model that they need to compare, it's a big, big process. Months already baked in. So you don't you don't think that they can delay further than the six months? I I don't know that answer. <laughs> with with sure a lawsuit, they could. Yeah, don't commit. <laughs> no, we got to move on. Uh, yeah. Deborah. One thing that has always got me and why can't we have or why can't between the MC and the um we have buses that go across the Outer Bridge, as well as the Gospel, as well as the Bayonne. I'm not talking about express buses because a lot of times, because a lot of people are very, and don't have cars, they have to take car service or also make it harder also when accessorize from either counties have to meet, it's very hard. Have they ever thought of that? What? What do you, what do you Because like, already say, I have to go to, um, talk to the private bus companies. 
that running no. thing. So no. I, no. if I don't need to go, what you mean. What is, if I'm on my steps for it and I need to do, I can get it sent now, no problem. But to get me over into Jersey, there's no way. Mm-hmm. That's, been a, that's been an issue that we looked at on the Metro North Community Council. Yeah. Um, because of making some of the stations accessible and having access, having accessible transit go from New York to New to stations that are managed by New Jersey, and that is not a problem that we've been able to to, to solve. So I've, it's just not a problem we've been able to solve. It's federal funding issue. Yes, I thought, but you don't you don't know why the answer is. That's why I asked instead of. I, I just know that it's a federal funding issue and the way that the funds are allocated mm-hmm. and to whom. That's, yeah. I mean, it would it would have to be require a lot more dive into that. But since it's an accessorized question, that would be a good question for Chris. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not not my Chris. The other Chris. The other Chris. Chris T. Yeah. Um, um, did right. you want to give um, any update on the uh, Faramation panel you were on? Sure. So at at um, on a beautiful day, uh, <laughs> and, and um, with no further delay, the um, the Blue Ribbon Panel on Payment Evasion released its report and its recommendations. I say payment evasion because as we heard from Jeremy and we've heard from others, mm-hmm. um, it's not just fair evasion, it's also evasion on tolls. Um, and the, you know, the, the big number that we're, that has been talked about is $690 million a year that's being evaded. Uh, one of the questions that came from, surprisingly, the Post was, uh, well, how come the MTA needs all this money? Can't they just recoup it? And I, and I said, it's not an either or. It's both. You know, it's there are different strategies to make up some of the funding that's lost, or funding that's lost. Not going to happen overnight. And then there's um, obviously the different things that need to be done to balance the budget. Now. We looked at um, through the lens of equity, environment, enforcement, and um, education. And there are different recommendations in the report on how to address each of those aspects. Um, and I encourage everybody to get the, um, the link out to you. Um, they're a pretty glossy copy. Yeah, We've beautiful. got one of them, but we got big pieces of paper initially. Um, they have it in book form. Now yeah, they have it in book form. Um, we will, if you're interested, we can uh, work on getting you copies of it. But it um, the Printed or online? Printed. It's available Printed. online, but no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but the um, can I? We'll try to get. Can I request that? Yes, yeah. please. The um, you know, enforcement is I know something that has been raised here a number of times. Um, part of that is uh, looked at under a number of different subcategories too. So um, they're trying several different strategies regarding uh, enforcement, including um, the use of unarmed guards. Uh, as they've been doing, and also spreading them to different stations. Um, the use of AI currently, that with no facial recognition, to um, see which stations have the highest levels of um, of fair um, The use of different toll, different um, fare gates, which is, if any of you saw the pictures in the paper, it was kind of hysterical <laughs> to see a reporter literally try to jump over it. Um, he fell on his keister. Or right. under it. it. You can go you under it. No, no, there is no around. No way you can go under it. No around. No. What you didn't have at the demo was the overhead bar, which will be in some place. Yes, yeah, there are several different kinds of things that you can't put your, the technical term is pointy thingies, on the sides of, um, the, of the, of the uh, even the current um, turnstile. So you can't just put your hands over and hop and bars on top so that you would make that harder. It's, I mean, it, that's not going to solve the under or back hop, but it will solve for two of the other things. There are um, currently some trials that are being done. A 15-second delay on the gate mm-hmm. when people don't want to wait. They just see that, and they just go out through the turnstiles. Um, Deborah, see your hand. Hold on. Yes, no, uh, but there are a number of... I, hold on. I'm not... I'm still talking now. There are still, um, you know, one of the one of the issues is that enforcement is also creating a um, a warning 
for people who are not the habitual or recidivist or criminal, you know, um, criminally minded and um, fair, but to let people know that there are resources available for them for um, uh, half fair um, resources um, through things like fair fairs, which we are continuing to try and have become 200% of the federal poverty level, uh, and other um, programs. So um, looking at a number of different options there, too. So um, I think that we'll see roll out of some of the implementations. It's a great event. It's still on YouTube. Um, the two co-chairs, uh, and Jeremy and Daniel from the MTA, gave great overview and introduction. Of, um, of the report and the recommendations, and I encourage you to have an hour or so to take a look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Are the prototypes okay, yeah. set up anywhere so we can see them? I went by yesterday and they were gone. Yeah, yeah no, they, gone. they must have been gone. There, there are um, probably photos. Ray, do you know if, if there's a photo library of the prototypes? Oh, yes. Yeah, there is. Um, uh, there is um, with our press release, but you know, I'll, 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 I'll It's I'll online. You can just go to YouTube, yeah, and it's I, right I there. video of some, too, if you guys want. Yeah, yeah, if you send that over to us, but, but it's, it's also it's over. on YouTube. You can are they like anywhere oh, physically? They were no. here, but... Were why the can't they be? They're huge. I know, but why <laughs> can't they? They, they still have them. Because they're also online from vendors who probably take their classes. Yeah. But it really is, a, a, you can see it absolutely clearly. They had it embargoed, and now it's on YouTube. You just go. I tried going through, and somebody tried walking right past me to try to go through, and it closed on them. So. Oh. Quickly. There are three or four different kinds. Yeah. And the one you're talking about, there is one in Atlantic right now at Barclay Center, which I was there this morning with the mechanic because we had to test the timer on it. Uh, and it's been working very well because... Uh, we had someone try to do, you know, fair invasion, which no, at least I did not go after them because invasion, I'm just, not invasion. E either way, because that's what I'm just saying. What they were trying to do, I'm just trying to go quick. Thank you. But the bottom line was, even I tested with the, my Omni card, went in, walk, you know, like a mega speed, and then they closed it right at you. So all I can say is, nice try. There's a few different uh, manufacturers of these, so it. We'll see which ones we decide to go for, but uh, the chairman said he would like to see them installed at the stations with the word fair evasion first. At what cost? I can't imagine how much they must cost. Um, but yes, but they cost benefit and yeah, the return on investment? This is money well spent. If we can stop those who are trying to do a criminal activity on their way, um, you know, it, it's when it's really money well spent. And we had, at some point, we'll have to replace our turnstiles anyway in our slam gates because people are yanking them open, and a lot of them are broken. So, might as well do the right thing. And they have to be, they have to be at the fire code. So, it's yes, part of do. capital improvement at the station. And yeah. making sure it's ADA accessible as well. Yeah, well, absolutely. Everything is done quite. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is there any uh, old business? I do. That will be quick. Andrew, I, you're supposed to get back to me on Seventh Avenue on the B and Q. I asked about it, and they said, thanks for letting us know, and that's the last I heard. I will ask again. And can you let them know I see crack now on the Manhattan side? I let them know there was actually a GO going on on several weekends, and mm -hmm. that station could have been addressed. Can we please make sure that's duty noted? As you know, I am very concerned about that station because there are cracks, and it needs to be checked because the safety is not any accessible, but it still someone can get hurt. And if you have to get on the train, I have to jump. I feel like I'm at 111th Street when they had that hole. I do? Oh, I thought I was scratching my own. Oh, oh, oh. I thought you said I had something in my face. Uh, but that is the one main issue I'd like to bring up, and that's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, can, I, can I just bring up a, a positive, end this on a positive note, because I'm always complaining about something or other. This time, coming here today, I was in car 2093 on the number six. And the conductor, at every stop, and I go from 77th Street to 42nd Street to Grand Central, as we were approaching, he's saying, this is for all the beautiful people on the train. Oh, I know. 
Have a safe day. Have a wonderful day. Public safety is what we care about more than anything else. Don't block the doors. Step out. Step. I mean, he was so positive. It brought a smile to my face. And, and you know, usually I'm complaining. They slam the doors in my face. And this is what I brought up um, when I said that we should do some positive things. So I'm living what I said we should do. And I don't know if I should if I should call it into one of you guys or I have it all written, well, my my own notes, but I'll bring it into the office. But I would like this conductor to, and I, the other thing is is that I was in car number 2093 on the number six. So uh, if you want to. And did the, the, put the time down What? The time, yes, it arrived at uh, E68 Street, so it must have been about two minutes before that. Uh, at 11.16, I even wrote down the time, at 11.16 p.m. at East 68th Street. So if you can put in something and do me a favor and CC me on whatever, you, whatever you're sending in and we'll put it in, in writing or can I? Oh, somehow, yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but I, as I said, it's so nice that when something Positive happened. Absolutely. Deborah, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. No, no. Avery was sure. answered. This will take one question. I asked one of six policemen who was loitering in the center, <laughs> not paying any. I said, why aren't you scattered out patrolling? And he said, because we're told to be here. Well, could someone find out if they're being told what job to do or just where to stand? I thought they are. Do you happen to know? And that's not the first time I was told. Do you know that. if they were NYPD or transit police? I, no, I don't. I think they were well, local police. police. I, I questioned some NYPD the other day. I said, you've got an un, yeah. unstaffed entrance down there, but tons of people are feeding. Why are you standing up here at the staffed entrance where there's a, a booth agent and everything? This told, is where we were told. Yeah. So would someone, and then the mayor's talking about how there's all, they have to have more people and overtime. Well, if you just make the ones who are there work, we wouldn't need the extra expense. I'm sorry. All right. Anything else? I want to end on a positive note. I'm sorry. Well, well, no, it's the truth. She's right. Mr. Now. X, you'll be the last one. Period. <laughs> I move to adjourn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Don't forget PCAC is a week from today. Yeah, and we're still waiting to hear about our guests.